Right, let's start our investigation by looking at the main line of the Evans Gambit. White offers the pawn, back takes, white gains time on the bishop, and the bishop drops back to a5. To an extent, dissuading white from playing d4. Yet white is not easily dissuaded. He just goes through with d4 right away. And what black mustn't do against the Evans Gambit, in my opinion, is get too greedy. If he starts taking pawns, this may be playable, but it's extremely risky. Instead, let's settle for the move d6, and the main line from here goes queen to b3. White attacks f7 without delay. And the reason for queen b3 is that it forces black to make an awkward looking queen move. Queen to d7. Now it may be that black can get away with a move like queen to e7 here. But white's point is that he wants to put the pawn in on d5. And should black retreat, then queen b5 check nabs the bishop on a5. Um, it's been shown that black might be able to get away with knight d4 here. Due to the fact that after knight takes, pawn takes, he's got an attack against the e4 pawn. But I'd rather not allow him that resource. So queen to d7 is the main line. And my first game is a very high level clash. Uh, you generally find black players, the strongest black players, playing the Laska defence. Uh, this comes from the European uh, Championship, played in Warsaw in 2005. And um, after this, D takes E5 was played. And now the whole point of the Laska defence is contained in the next move, Bishop B6. Black is happy to give back the pawn he won after Bishop takes B4, and to set up ideas of Knight A5. That's the main point of bishop b6. Uh, he's not too worried if white takes on d6. We'll see an example of that a bit later on. But um, the idea is in general to return the pawn to get a good position. And to leave white with fragmented pawns. So there's always a spectre of some sort of bad endgame for white in this variation. And that's what black is hoping for. If white doesn't play the attack, attack very accurately or finds a way into black's position, then black will just get a better uh, structure and hopefully the better middle game and end game as a result. So white's got it all to prove and Kurnasov plays knight bd2. He has to allow black's threat but his idea is that he's going to get active play for his knight after queen c2, knight takes bishop, knight takes bishop. Well this position's been seen many times and um, once again in keeping with the positional idea of the Laska defence I think the best move for black here is d5. Striking a blow in the centre and um, forcing white to think about what he's going to do, how he's going to compensate for his poor pawn structure. Well Kornasov took off the pawn, centralising the queen and then he gave a check protecting his knight. The main idea behind this is that white wants to take on b6 with the knight and black can't recapture with the a pawn. So c takes b6 was played, queen b4. So to a degree, white has repaired the pawn structure damage in the sense that he's also inflicted double pawns on black. Nevertheless, bishop b5. Black plays for the initiative and keeps the white king in the centre. Bishop g5 and black plays h6. Whereupon white goes knight to d4. With opposite colour bishops on the board, the initiative is important. So um, I guess black certainly doesn't want h takes g5 here, knight takes b5, when there are rather unpleasant threats. So a battle for the initiative's in full swing. Black retreated his bishop. White went bishop e3. This allows black to the time he needs to get his knight out. And after castling... Sargissian went queen to c5, queen to b3, and now the cold-blooded move, queen takes e5, intending to answer rook a e1 with queen to f6, and knight b5 with castles. So black has negotiated the opening complications, and he's a pawn up. White's still got a poor structure on the queen side, but he does have 
the right to move. And that means he can launch some sort of an attack and hope to keep black at bay by continually harrying the black queen, for instance. But queen g5 looks like a good answer because it counterattacks the knight on b5. White plays f4, allowing the capture, and white's idea is that he comes in with the rook to e7. There's a trade on b3, bishop c6, and of course we now reach what will be a very unpleasant endgame for white. I mean, it's probably a draw, but not easy. Black's task in endgames of this type is number one, to negate the opponent's initiative, whatever initiative they may be. Seems like it's a one-piece initiative here. And secondly, to somehow create a pass pool. And so we're looking for black maybe to play moves like b5, a5, a4. That's how black can entertain hopes of winning this position. So white, for his own part, has got to somehow keep his initiative together. So rook fe1. f6, blocking out the bishop. King f2, and black starts the process of creating that pass pawn uh, by playing b5. b4, holding up the queen side, advance. Rook f7, it's a good idea to exchange off the rook. White is not interested. It's not in his interest to see pieces coming off the board in this situation. And now perhaps a slightly surprising move, a5. Of course, the drawback is you can't create a pass pawn anymore that easily. The advantage is you bring your rook into the game. So it seems to me black wants to play with uh, only two results in mind. Um, a win and a draw. Bishop c5 was answered by rook d7. I think by playing a5, by bringing his last piece into the game, he's insured himself against any defeat, any tricks, because white really struggles to create any tricks at all in this position. So black brings his rook down to the 7th rank, white is happy to trade, and blocks in anticipation of a quick handshake after rook takes rook, king takes, bishop takes, uh, g2. The extra pawn is insignificant, and uh, white shouldn't have too many problems drawing this. So rook d8 was played, the rook came in, and black played h5 just securing the entry of his king into the game. Rook back to e7, pawn up to g6, and white played rook e2, awaiting events. So how is black going to win this? Well, he's going to turn the screw. He's going to gradually improve his position and wait to see what crops up. The problem for white is he can never, ever win this position. And those sorts of situations are kind of torture in a game because you know it's going to go on forever and you can never win. So black can apply psychological as well as positional pressure. And he continues the pressure with h4. White takes. Not everybody's cup of tea uh, to take. But um, yeah, well, I think black is... Black is not going to allow king takes f4 and a move like bishop e7. So after g takes h4, he plays rook h8, rook f2, rook takes h4, and you see the pressure has increased because white's now got three isolated pawns. Kurnasov obviously thinks he can defend them using his bishop. Black continues to improve matters by shuffling around and awaiting events. Rook d2 was answered by rook h3 and rook g2 by rook h4. Bishop e3, rook h8. Black doesn't see a clear way to go on and win this position, so he just keeps the game on the boil, keeps white at the board. No draw just yet. Rook d6, rook a6. Well, of course, it's a completely different story if white allows black a pass pawn. So white plays rook b6, and black brings his king in. Bishop d4, and now f5. And white takes on b7. So king takes f4. Well, things have definitely improved for black over the last few moves. He's outmaneuvered white to the extent that he's got a pass pawn. h4, and now king g4. Is it winning? Well, I mean, let's face it, who wants to be white in this situation? The problem is, 
you're fighting against the past pawn. You're fighting against a possible black attack because um, your king has to stay on the back rank and it will invariably be weak there. So black marches on. The rook comes in behind the passed pawn. There's a check driving the king away, cutting the king off even further. And now the bishop comes back to e6. And the idea of that is to play bishop f5, enabling the pawn to be shepherded home. And I'm not sure that white can do much about this. Rook comes to b2, king e1, king g3. You know, white gradually has to accept that black is going to infiltrate. Rook f8, king g2, rook f4. How does black break through like this? King d1, f2, and that was the end of the game. Well, clearly, any sort of proponent of the Evans Gambit is going to want more out of the opening than that. For the time being, I'll just say the Lasker defence with Bishop b6 is very reliable. Let's see some more games.